Preparations for this Sunday's electoral drill are advancing in Venezuela ahead of the regional elections to be held on November 21st. The Inter-American Commission on Human Rights has dismissed a petition for precautionary measures of protection presented by lawyers of former Bolivian de facto president Janine Agnes. In Libya, guards shot six asylum seekers dead at an overcrowded Tripoli detention facility as thousands attempted to escape. From the headquarters of Teleso English in Havana, Cuba, this is on the south, and I'm Katrina Goss. Preparations for this Sunday's electoral draw advance in Venezuela ahead of the regional elections will be held on November 21st, when governors, mayors, state legislators and municipal council members will be elected. From Caracas, our correspondent Andre Vieira has the details. More than 400 polling stations in 333 municipalities will be enabled this Sunday to carry out a simulation vote ahead of the November 21st elections across Venezuela. It is very important for the Electoral Council, but it is also very important for citizens because it allows voters to become familiar with the process, with the components, and with the electoral proposal. With a little more than a month to go before electing more than 3,000 regional officials, political parties are intensifying their campaign actions. The elections will be marked by the participation of all sectors of the opposition. Part of the opposition is returning to the polls after being defeated in its attempt to take control of the state by means of anti-democratic acts. We announced to the national and international community our participation in the regional and municipality elections of November 21st, 2021 with the Democratic National Unity electoral ticket. Chavista forces have won 26 out of 28 elections in 22 years of the Bolivarian Revolution. While talks are ongoing with part of the opposition in Mexico, the government continues with its activities demanding an end to the blockade imposed on Venezuela and calls on its supporters to contest on a vote-by-vote -vote basis. Each one of us will find just three, three of those who are unhappy with the opposition, those who never welcomed the revolution, but who have never been abandoned by the revolution. The activity of this October the 10th will be accompanied by observers from the Carter Center and the Latin American Council of Electoral Experts. More than 3,000 officials will be working to carry out all the necessary tests for the proper functioning of the voting system. At the same time, the electoral authorities are calling for the mass participation of citizens. On behalf of the National Electoral Council, I extend an invitation to the country not to skip this wonderful experience on Sunday, the electoral drill. During the election drill, polling stations will be open from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. Maintaining health precautions against COVID-19 is as important as participating. Wear a mask, maintain distance, and disinfect your hands. In Uruguay, lawmakers of the Broad Front Coalition are calling for the annulment of the extension of the concession of Montevideo's port container terminal to a Belgian company until the year 2080. The legislative bench of the Front appeared before the Public Prosecutor's Office on Friday to complain that the granting of the concession to the Belgian Catio Nate company for 50 years lacks of formal and constitutional grounds as the government of Luis Lacalpo did not follow administrative procedures and has now created a private and foreign monopoly of the crucial terminal. The move has sparked condemnation by port workers who staged several strikes. Mexican authorities have discovered over 600 Central American asylum seekers at six trailers near the United States border. The trucks were stopped at a military checkpoint on a highway in the northern state of Tamaulipas. The Public Safety Agency said that four suspects of human trafficking were arrested. Most of those found were Guatemalans, while others had travelled from Honduras and El Salvador. More than half of those aboard the trucks were children, and nearly 200 of them were not accompanied by an adult. The northern state is a popular route for people smuggling, as the closest border state for Central Americans.
United States President Joe Biden officially raised the refugee admissions cap for the 2022 fiscal year after his administration admitted a record low number of refugees for the year 2021. With only 11,400 refugees admitted, despite setting the cap at 62,500, the Biden administration has admitted the lowest number of refugees into the United States in 40 years. At the same time, deportations continue of people who managed to cross the US border seeking asylum as seen recently with thousands of Haitians. On Friday, Biden officially raised the refugee admissions cap to 125,000 for this fiscal year, but it remains to be seen just how many people his administration will actually grant asylum to. And we'll be right back after this very short break. Don't go away. Welcome back to From the South. The Bolivian Foreign Ministry reported that the Petition for Precautionary Measures of Protection presented by lawyers of former de facto President Janine Agnes to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights was dismissed. The move represented part of the international campaign by the country's far right against the current government as it works to guarantee justice for the victims of the 2019 coup and the de facto regime led by Agnes. Our correspondent Freddy Morales brings us more details in the following report. The document of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights consists of two pages. They have decided to dismiss the request for precautionary measures in favor of Ms. Giannis Agnes and Carolina Rivera. Carolina is the daughter of Mrs. Agnes, who had also requested international protection. The Inter-American Commission grants precautionary measures in protection in cases of serious events that could violate human rights and in urgent cases to preserve that right where there is also risk of permanent harm. In this case, the Inter-American Commission did not find any of these elements. The Bolivian government had been denounced before the ICHR for violation of the principles and best practices on the protection of the persons deprived of liberty in the Americas. The Inter-American Convention on the Prevention, Punishment and Eradication of Violence Against Women the Declaration of the Basic Principles of Justice for Victims of Crime and Abuse of Power, the United Nations Standard, Minimum Rules for the Treatment of Prisoners, and the Principles for the Protection of Persons with Mental Illness. It is also certain that the plurinational state of Bolivia, through its justice and security institutions, has always guaranteed the health and life of Janine Agnes to the extent that we can affirm that the whole situation reported by the media and through them heard by the population has been practically staged. It was a setup to try to discredit the Bolivian state. Mrs. Añez has been in preventive detention in La Paz since March, as prosecutors investigate the case known as the coup d'etat. In the last two months, she carried out an extensive international campaign about alleged risks to her health, which included an alleged suicide attempt. The far right that placed her in government after the coup defined a strategy of protests to demand total impunity and judicial resolution of this and other cases in which the de facto government is accused. Freddy Morales, Telesur, Bolivia. In Greece, clashes between anti-fascist protesters and police broke out Saturday during a demonstration marking a year since the far-right Golden Dawn Party was ruled a criminal organization. Police used tear gas to disperse the protesters. The neo-Nazi party founded in the 1980s rose to become Greece's third largest party during the country's financial crisis and was seen as a model for many far-right groups worldwide. The party saw members elected to the Greek parliament in four separate elections, maintaining a presence between 2012 and 2019. However, on October 7, 2020, a Greek court ruled that the party was operating as a criminal organisation in a landmark verdict following a five-year-long trial. The ruling came as the court analysed extremism by the party, including the fatal stabbing of a Greek rap singer, attacks on migrant fishermen and attacks on left-wing activists. In the Czech Republic, voters turned out for the final day of the country's parliamentary elections this Saturday, with polls suggesting Prime Minister Andre Babis has a good chance of retaining power, despite a turbulent first term featuring numerous scandals. Two days of balloting to fill 200 seats in the lower house of the Czech Republic's parliament took place in the immediate wake of the leak of the Pandora Papers, 
which reported Babis put over $20 million into shell companies to buy 16 properties in France. The PM has denied any wrongdoing. During his electoral campaign, Babis portrayed migration as a threat, even though his country is not a typical destination for asylum seekers. He also condemned the 27-member European Union's plan to tackle climate change. In Italy, demonstrators took to the streets of Rome to protest against the use of a COVID-19 health pass to enter workplaces. Workers in both the public and private sectors must display the health pass in order to gain access to their workplaces from October 15th under a government decree. The measures are the first by a major European economy requiring proof of vaccination, a recent negative virus test or recovery from COVID-19 in the previous six months for all categories of workers. Slovenia and Greece adopted similar measures this week. Personally, I will do the tests to go to work. Is that what the government wants? Fine. I will pay and pay to work. It's really absurd. I have accelerated my retirement, so my last day of work will be October 15th, and I will spend it at home because they forced me to show this fascist pass. One Ebola case has been recorded in the Democratic Republic of Congo five months after the latest epidemic of the disease in the country was declared over. The case concerns a three-year-old boy who was hospitalized and died on October 6, the health ministry reported in a statement, adding that the case was detected in Beni in North Kivu province. A sample taken from the child was sent to Goma, the provincial capital, and was found to be positive for Ebola. Health teams on the ground are working to trace and monitor around 100 contacts of the child, as well as decontaminate health facilities. Absolutely. The fear exists, because since Ebola disappeared, we couldn't bear to think that it could arise once again. That's why I express my fear, of course. And we have more stories coming up after this final short break. Stay with us. Welcome back to From the South. In Libya, the abuses against people seeking asylum continue. On Friday, guards shot dead six people held at an overcrowded Tripoli detention facility as thousands attempted to escape. People who managed to escape the site have gathered outside the headquarters of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees in the Libyan capital, demanding to be allowed to leave the country. The Al Mabani detention centre in Tripoli was at triple its capacity following police raids against residents last week. The International Organization for Migration reported that the shooting was related to overcrowding and the terrible, very tense situation. There is systematic abuse of asylum seekers attempting to reach Europe, stopped by Libyan authorities and militia groups, fueled by European Union money, given to a country where violence has been normalized after years of instability. Yesterday, refugees fled because they were not provided with food or drinks. The people inside are tired and sick. Migration is not a crime. People came to Libya because they had problems in their country. We are very tired and we are asking for a helping hand for all Arab and European countries. We are all tired. We are currently on the streets. Even the agency refuses to open the doors for us to leave our children, disabled people and the elderly with them. The, the real problem that we wanted here is that when we have come here, we have nothing. First, we are suffering a lot, and the second, we have we have an issue. Our issue is is that we would like to get out from this country. We have not any place to live, and we have not any place to to sleep. Lebanon's electricity grid collapsed on Saturday after its two main power plants ran out of fuel, plunging much of the crisis-ridden country into darkness. According to the authorities, the blackout could continue for several days as part of the energy crisis which has affected the operation of both facilities. The Duramar and Sarani power plants provide about 40% of the entire country's electricity. Officials informed that the state-owned power company will use the Army's fuel oil reserve to temporarily run the plants so as to help alleviate the situation. The fuel sorting 
shortage in Lebanon has forced many businesses to close, exposing a population to speculative prices in the black market in the midst of the collapse of the local currency. The Taliban has rolled out cooperation with the United States to contain extremist groups in Afghanistan ahead of the first direct talks between the two sides since the U.S. withdrew its troops from the country in August. Senior Taliban officials and U.S. representatives are set to meet on Saturday and Sunday in Doha, the capital of Qatar, to address efforts to control extremist groups and evacuate nationals and foreigners from Afghanistan. Taliban political spokesman Sulay Shaheen stressed that there would be no cooperation with Washington to contain the Islamic State, the terrorist group that has taken responsibility for several recent attacks attacks, including a suicide bombing that killed 46 Shiite Muslims and wounded dozens during prayers at a mosque in the northern city of Kunduz on Friday. China on Saturday held a commemorative meeting to mark the 110th anniversary of the 1911 revolution that toppled China's last imperial dynasty. President Xi Jinping delivered a speech on what the past 110 years have meant for the Chinese people. He noted that commemorating this historical event serves to inspire and rally the sons and daughters of the Chinese nation, both at home and abroad, to work towards the great national rejuvenation. The president also urged the Chinese people to stick together through good times and bad in order to overcome all risks and challenges on the road ahead and stressed the need of res resolutely safeguarding China's national sovereignty, security and development interests. This year marks the 110th anniversary of the Revolution of 1911 and the centenary of the Communist Party of China. The Chinese people are taking big strides forward with confidence in attaining the second centenary goal of making China a great modern socialist country in all respects. On this special occasion, we gather here to commemorate the historic exploits of revolutionary pioneers like Dr. Sun Yat-sen to emulate and carry forward their lofty spirit of working with unshakable resolve to revitalize China and to inspire and rally the sons and daughters of the Chinese nation at home and abroad to work together to realize the rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. Ugandan climate activist Vanessa Nakati on Saturday visited a fast German open pit coal mine and a village that's to be bulldozed for its expansion, saying the destruction is really disturbing and has implications far beyond Germany. The visit by Nakati and other young climate activists comes a few weeks before UN climate talks open in Glasgow, Scotland at the end of the month. The activist said weather patterns were changing in her country and they were witnessing extreme conditions due to rising global temperatures. The German mine, operated by utility giant RWE, has become a focus of protest by people who want the country to stop extracting and burning coal as soon as possible. Activists and local residents say expanding the mine runs counter to Germany's goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions to meet the Paris climate climate accords target of capping global warming at 1.5 degrees Celsius. Coal mining is due to end in Germany by 2038, but environmentalists say it needs to stop much earlier. I came to see how much destruction is being done in Luzerat with the coal mine and to see how much of this destruction is not just affecting the people in this place but also the people in my country Uganda. It's absurd that my friend Vanessa has to come here from Uganda to show people that what we are doing here in Germany that what RWE is doing here that's affecting countries like Uganda. And we've come to the end of this news brief. Remember, you can find these and many of our stories on our website at tellysoenglish.net. You can also follow us on social media for all the latest news. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and Telegram. For Tellysoenglish, I'm Katrina Goss. Thank you for watching.